Okay. Dust has settled. Willie Taggart was fired. I believe we all knew it was coming. Actually, I believe he knew. If you go back and watch the video, I do believe that he was almost crying after the Miami game, post-game interviews, and I think the writing was on the wall. Obviously, I felt like he would get a third year, but I never truly believed that he was the answer, or I never truly believed that he was going to get us to where we want to go. Uh, he wasn't one of my picks. And I didn't even know who really who he was to everybody was talking about. He'll be going to Florida and he ended up leaving Oregon to come to Florida State. He's fired right inside of two years. Didn't even get to finish this season. So with saying that, firing Willie Taggart, basically at this time with three games left to go, means that we're not taking a coach that's just the hot candidate. We're not taking an unproven commodity. We want a proven coach. Key thing to remember in the AD's conversation in the interview, he said he wants a coach that can win national championships. So that does not mean I want a coach that can win a national title. He wants multiple championships. Now, I'm going to start off this conversation. I'm going to break down what ultimately cost all of our coaches up to this point. And what I see are things that need to be done for us to get back on top. Remember, this is all opinion. So just bear with me. Now, starting in 1996, Florida State goes into the Florida game, one versus two. They end up winning. They go to number one. They go to the Sugar Bowl. They draw the Gators. Gators beat Alabama. They win the SEC championship. Steve Spurrier makes a key adjustment against Mickey Andrews' defense. He goes from under center to gun. Florida wins. They win the national championship. The Knowles should have had the national championship that year. Should have been Bobby Bowden's first undefeated season. It did not happen. Fast forward from the 1997 Sugar Bowl to the season 1997. The Knowles go into the swamp, ranked number one. They have a four-point lead with about a minute and 56 seconds left on the clock. The Gators drive down the field scoring three plays. Cost us another national championship. 1998. Obviously, we roll into 1998 with a new quarterback, Chris Winkie. Right out the gate, we play Texas A&M. We win. We look good. Uh, we end up going to NC State. <clears throat> Winky to Warwick is a touchdown. Big play. And from that point on, NC State, I think they had five interceptions on Chris Winkie. He ends up getting hurt against Virginia. Uh, obviously, Marcus Alston is the guy we kind of struggle. Warwick saves out since was one of the greatest plays in college football. And then you had Texas A&M taking down uh, K-State, Miami, Adrian James beating UCLA, put us back in the national championship game against Tennessee. Obviously, it was a good football game. If we have Winky, we win, but we don't. Galvanized the whole team. 1999, we come out. It's set in written stone, wire to wire, number one. Get our first undefeated season. We get it done. Enter 2000. 2000 is a pivotal year for Bobby Bowden. This is literally his last best team. I would rank the 2000 team right behind the 93, 99, 2013. I think I'd rank them right up there with 2014 or the 9017. This team is literally loaded, glittered with talent. We roll. We come in the Orange Bowl against Miami. Miami has been rebuilding, and they're basically saying they're back. We had a 16-game winning streak at the time. Good football game. Butch, Butch Davis and his staff did a good job of out-coaching Bobby Bout and his staff. They did a lot of things with Davenport and DJ Williams and a lot of things with the tight ends. And defensively, they were shutting down the nose every time they wanted to go to the tight end. Good game. It goes back and forth. We come back. We rally. Come back. Defense thought they was going to get off the field, led to a touchdown. The Knowles drive, get in position for a field goal. Winky runs off the field. He's running off the field. He sees the kicker. He tells him to make it. Obviously, we miss it. We end up going out, and all intents and purposes, we roll after this loss. We end up getting the Gators in the swamp. We destroy them. The computers like us, put us in the national championship. Marvin Menace. Misses his exam, did not play. And at this time, we're talking about every receiver on the roster was a D1 starter, NFL caliber receiver. But Marvin Menace was Winky's guy. We didn't get it done. Oklahoma wins. We know going into 2001, we were rebuilding because we lost a lot of depth and a lot of seniors. Winky, Minor, Menace, Sprague, four out of five stars on the offensive line, Jamal Reynolds, 
David Warren, Tommy Polly, Brian Allen, Cleveland Thomas, Tay Cody, Derek Gibson, and a lot of guys that were quality backups off the 2000 team are gone. So the Knowles have depth, they're talented, but they tried to petition the NCAA for basically an extension to allow Marcus Allison to play. It did not work. We had no choice but to play a red shirt freshman, Chris Ricks. We ended up getting eight wins that year. Possibly with a quarterback, we may have got one or two more wins, but we did. In comes 2003, everything, 2002, sorry, 2002. Everything is going good. All the depth, all the talent is back. Now, the biggest things about the Bowden era towards the end, Bowden would not make key staff changes. Mickey Andrews stayed on too long. He had the wrong offensive coordinator, wrong quarterback coach. What I mean by this Basically, if he had Mark Rick or an equal value offensive coordinator, Chris Ricks, Adrian McPherson, Xavier Lee, and maybe even Drew Weatherford are in the NFL. But we did not develop our quarterbacks. We weren't developing players at that time because we lost Darling. One of the Darling twins died, and I think that would basically hurt the program because we were not pushing and training and conditioning and getting our players to the shape we're used to because of that death. He had a, a problem, and it arose and caused him his life. He didn't know it, but we was not pushing and developing our players for a while, and that hurt. So we go into 2002, talent deep loaded. A lot of mistakes are made. Great game against Miami. Should have won that game. We missed the field goal. We should have beat Louisville. Obviously, Chris Ricks plays better or has a better coach, better offensive coordinator. We probably beat Notre Dame. And if he plays in the bowl game, we beat Georgia. I mean, just look at the score. Look at the way it was played. If we had a quarterback, we win that game. So Bobby Bowden could have had 10, 11 wins that year. Enter 2003, his last great recruiting class. The height of his recruiting was on display in 2003. Obviously, Ernie Sims, Lamar, <clears throat> excuse me, Ernie Sims, Antonio Camardi, Timmons, a bunch of other guys that played in the NFL were on that roster. They were loaded. 2003, they lost to Miami. Uh, I think Ricks had two or three interceptions in that game. Obviously, Sean Taylor took one back to the house. But the key game was on a Saturday night against uh, Old Clemson. They were ranked number three in the country. If they win that game for all intents and purposes, they would go on to the national championship because when nobody beat them, they lost that game, but they ended up having Ricks to Sam. We got 10 wins. Some kind of way we drew Miami in the Orange Bowl. We lost. So from 2004 to 2009, Bobby Bowden and his staff are struggling. They're not developing players. We're not coaching right. In comes a whole shakeup, a joke at the program. He hires a, a bunch of staff. He brings in Jimbo, Jimbo and all these guys. And they end up getting nine wins in 2008 or 2009. Six wins. Mickey announces, hey, I'm going to retire. So then the question becomes, do we let Bobby hire him or do we let Jimbo hire him? And well, they say, well, let's let Jimbo do it. And Jimbo becomes the head coach. After six and six season, regular season, they win the bowl game, go to seven win. Bobby Bowden is essentially forced out. In comes Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo Fisher comes in. He makes tremendous upgrades, pushing money for facilities. We get 10 wins. We beat Miami and Florida that year. We go to the ACC championship. 10 wins. Programs on the right track. We're moving ahead. 2011, we come out. We struggle a little bit. We lose E.J. Manuel, but we're able to get eight wins in the regular season. Then we're going into a situation where we get nine wins. We win the bowl game. 2012, really, they should have played for the national championship. Uh, we had 12 wins. We started our streak. E.J. Manuel solidified himself as one of the greatest quarterbacks in college football. But we got up big. We got up 17 nothing against NC State. We took our foot off the gas, NC State wins. I was at the Florida game that year. That was my first time going. That was a tremendous atmosphere, great game. And they were leading Florida in the lead, controlling the game. E.J. Manuel gets hurt. Florida comes back and win. We limp into the ACC championship. We win that. We go on. I went to the Orange Bowl that year, and they just throttled uh, the team out of Illinois. 2013 speaks for itself. 2014, the first significant thing about Jimbo Fisher is that he hires the wrong defensive coordinator. 
it got exposed in the, in the um in the Rose Bowl. We lose to Oregon. 2015, I went five games that year, two wins, three losses. We're a good team. We're ranked. I think Jimbo Fisher never should have took EG. He should have let McGuire start. But I went to the uh, Georgia Tech game. We could not score in the second half. EG tried to hit Travis Rudolph in the end zone. He gets intercepted. It was a good back and forth battle. I think the quarterback had a long 70 yard touchdown run. And we play good. It comes down to the wire. We're going to kick a long field goal. We miss it. They run it back for a touchdown. Shouldn't have lost that game. Then I went to Delft Valley, watched the play against Clemson. First play from scrimmage. Dalvin Cook house call, 70 some yards. We could not, at this time, score. Field goals. Could not sustain drives. Defense was okay. Charles Kelly was okay coach, but he wasn't a great defense coordinator. So we lose that game. Then we basically just got outclassed, outcoached, outfocused in the um, Peach Bowl, and I was at that game. Now, that's 2015. 2016, a lot of the same things were going on. Obviously, players not being developed, coaching, scheme, offensive line, because the first game of the year, DeAndre Francois take a beating, but we win, and we had some strokes. But there's pretty much nothing I can say about Louisville. Louisville just flat out hammered us. We were ranked number two. And we roll into 2017 after coming back, manning up, destroying Michigan in the Orange Bowl, and we're ranked biggest season open ever against Alabama. And we did not get it done. It was a good game. The one thing I took away from the game was in the second half when Alabama normally lines up behind that big, massive offensive line and they're going to put the game away, we kept fighting. But we struggled. Jimbo Fisher obviously had a lot mentally going on. And let me say this to be clear. There's no way on earth if you have a job, and let's say you're making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, somebody calls you and says, hey, I'm going to pay you a million dollars a year for seven years. Guarantee whether we shut down, whether we lay off, whether we get uh, consolidated. It, it's just, it was a better offer. Better facilities. He took it. Now, the biggest problem moving on to Willie Taggart. Willie Taggart comes in, lethal simplicity, do something. And the biggest things I remember when he first came in is that they had anonymous coaches say the most overrated coaches in college football, and he was on that list. Well, then you get to the, the music, and I said, man, you know what? He's, he's, he's okay. He's okay. You know, the music and practice, I, don't, I see the guys laughing and playing. Obviously, he was hired before the bowl game. He was hired in early December. Literally, from that moment all the way to Labor Day, and the best you can do was nothing against Virginia Tech. It, it just never, never jailed. Now, let's understand some people will say that Willie Taggart basically could not get the staff he wanted. I don't believe that. But you got to understand some. When they got Willie Taggart, they had to pay Oregon and pay South Florida. So you weren't going to get Jim Levitt and Mario Cristobal because those are five, six hundred thousand dollar coaches. So you're talking about two, three million dollars a piece and you just paid two school and you just got a coach at five million dollars a year. So you weren't going to do that. But he made bad hires. He made bad decisions. Now, obviously, my point on him is Dugans, Frady, Browse were the three best hires he made. And Browse got hired at two million dollars a year. So it's not like he couldn't make good hire, but you're not going to be a school and financially, I'm going to pay you 30 million, over $30 million, and I'm going to pay, I got to pay South Florida and Oregon, and I'm going to pay two more coaches, two or $3 million buyout, then pay them a salary. No. Now, I wasn't sold on Levitt anyway, because Levitt has been a head coach. He's been an NFL coach and in college, but he was not coaching this year. So I didn't think he was ultimately the answer anyway. But Willie Taggart basically... Is misorganization, uh, penalties, it was the same thing. It just never translated. So he got let go with three games left to go in the season because he, the team never showed improvement. Yes, he improved things off the field, and he may have started improvement. But mediocrity, 6-6, six and six, is not what Florida State won't. And all intents and purposes, looking good against Syracuse isn't going to save a job. I hate it for him. But you just look at it. It, it, it was there. From, from day one, it, it, it was everybody was happy. We thought, well, he's going to come in and he's got this new offense and 
but it's the same eight plays called in order and I got variations offered, but I only run the same eight plays. We could not pass block, could not run block. Before Willie Taggart, Florida State had a thousand yard rusher every year since 2013. Every year before Willie Taggart's first year. You have to understand that we struggled in 2017, but we had a thousand yard rusher and we had a guy get injured and got 800 yards. So I thought that was the biggest thing to me is he did not, could not run the ball. Obviously, they finally went with the wild cam. Since Cam Akers been on campus, I was wondering the whole time, why didn't Jimbo Fisher ever use that offense? And people will say, well, people want critical of Jimbo like this. You're a damn lie. Everybody was jumping on Jimbo because they knew the team was better. I remember when the fan called him out on the call, on the show. And he just they had to score them off instead of answering the question. He got into it with a fan in the stand. Jimbo Fisher made $5.7 million. And he was not man enough to tell Rick Trigger it's time to do something different. He would not tell Charles Kelly that. But when he takes this new job, he don't even take them with him. The guys that he wasn't man enough to get rid of in Tallahassee wouldn't take them to College Station because he's gutless. But I'm not mad at him because if I was offered $75 million guarantee, I would leave too. It was the way he left. But let's on this note, Jimbo did say Clemson is going to pass us. He told the administration that. They laughed, did not believe him. Now look at us. Now going forth, Obviously, we got to get a coach. I don't think you can settle for a P.J. Flack. He's already just read up. I don't think you can settle for a, a Mark Stoops. You can't take a Lane Kiffin. You got to get somebody that's going to get this program back on track. Me personally, my top pick would be David Shaw, Pete Carroll. I think, I think Bob Stoops would be a good hire if he was to come. But a lot of people talk down on he never done that. You must not see his record of the home. The only difference between him and Bobby Bowden is Bobby Bowden has two national championships. Bobby Bowden played in a lot of national championship games and lost too. But he got his team there. He was a model of consistency, and he can play. I think he would be. But ultimately, I don't know who we're going to get. Like I say again, I just named a few. And the last one I think people really need to look at is probably Chris Peterson. I think you get him $6 million. Give him the staff he needs, build the facilities, and I think he'll get this program back on track. I think he's a great coach. I think he's a hell of a recruiter. And he can get it done. I wouldn't mind seeing Charlie Strong. Uh, at this point, I'm not susceptible not to say I wouldn't mind Randy Shannon. Uh, Mark Ricks, I think Mark Rick would be a good fit, but I think we're going to have to get this done. Obviously, Everybody, the biggest problem in the, in the Bowden's tenure, the in the Jimbo, and ultimately what undid Willie Taggart is player development, strength and conditioning, the right assistants, the right coaches, the right coordinators. So hopefully this come in, bring in the staff, bring in the support staff, and he can get it done. If you like my video, like, subscribe to my channel. If you don't, at least leave me a comment. But I think... And ultimately, in the end, you can see it. Just look at the numbers. Look at the coaching. Assistance, strength and conditioning, developing players all play a major part in the demise of Bowden, the demise of Jimbo, and ultimately, it never gave Willie Taggart a chance. He, did, he had a decent staff, but not a Florida State staff, not a national championship elite coaching staff for the most part. And he didn't develop players. Players were worse than I mean, we're, we're undisciplined. The biggest downfall for Willie Taggart was his defensive coordinator. I mean, I said, this guy's coming in. He was at Michigan State. Michigan State made it to the national championship. He's done a lot more with a lot less. He red shirt. He developed guy, taught guys, coached guy. But it just never translated in the ACC. So hopefully the next coach should come in, get a tremendous staff, coach these players up, and maybe pull off seven, eight wins, nine wins in his first season. Hopefully get maybe eight, nine in the second season. By that time, he'll have his recruits in, third year, start to build. Because I don't think the current the current roster as itself is going to need a lot of coaching to be able to play. But let me say this, regardless of where we finish recruiting, it's a lot of teams in the top 25 that don't near have enough talent to even be on the field with Florida State right now. UAB. Boise State, it's a lot of teams that are ranked. And I mean they're ranked and they got a loss or less 
So you can coach him up and produce. Now, Oregon with one loss, do you think they would be that one loss team, Willie Taggart or not? You have to ask yourself that question. But if you like, like I say, you like what I say, subscribe or comment. But the future is recruiting, developing players. Get a coach that can get a staff and get the facilities to compete at an elite level. Thank you.